It's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Ted Dawson. We are very lucky to have him uh, be here with us today to speak for us on this important topic. Ted Dawson, MD, PhD, is the Leonard and Madeline Abramson Professor in Neurodegenerative Diseases and Director of the Institute for Cell Engineering at John Hopkins. Medicine. He received his MD in pharmacology PhD from the University of Utah, followed by neurology residency at University of Pennsylvania and movement disorders fellowship at John Hopkins. His laboratory has made important discoveries on how neurons die in models of Parkinson's disease, which are enabling clinical strategies for disease modifying therapies for various neurodegenerative disorders. Dr. Dawson, thank you so much for being here today, and I will pass it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, and um, thank you for the introduction. Um, let me go to the next slide here. These are my disclosures, and um, we'll get into the um, meat of the talk. I, I thought it would be helpful to just give a little background before um, delving into um, the effects of um, exercise on um, Parkinson's disease and some of the findings that my laboratory has made. I think as many of you know, um, Parkinson's disease is one of the leading causes of serious long-term disability in the US and world. There's um, no disease-modifying therapies. And what I mean by disease-modifying therapies, therapies that slow or halt progression. Um, there are good, relatively good symptomatic therapies, particularly early in the course of the disease, you know, such as Cinemet, dopamine agonists. And then as the disease progresses, um, you know, deep brain stimulation, um, can um, treat some of the side effects of the medication. There are 6 million cases worldwide. And in the U.S., it's estimated that it costs about $52 billion a year. And it's a chronic global neurodegenerative disease with both non-motor and motor symptoms. And this is um, illustrated in this slide here. You know, I, I, I think um, what brings um, patients to a neurologist you know, is the slowness in movement, um, the inability to move, the problems with balance, and the tremor and the shuffling gait. But patients with Parkinson's disease also have a number of other um, problems such as REM sleep disorder. And REM sleep disorder is a disorder in, um, when you are in REM sleep, instead of not moving, you actually move. And um, it's become a feature of the illness that may provide some insight into the early causes of Parkinson's disease. Um, patients also have anxiety, depression, and as the disease progresses, up to about 80% of patients can become demented. Um, also, um, hallucinations. There's widespread neuropathology throughout the nervous system, from the gut, stomach, all the way up to the brain. And there's been studies that have suggested that the substantia nigra is not the first site of injury and that it may actually occur down in the gut or the olfactory bulb. And patients also have constipation, urinary, um, erectile, and sexual dysfunction. And all these um, symptoms progress with time. Well, there's been an enormous amount of research that's been done um, over the last um, several years. Um, and what's really 
um, driven the field in the last 20 years is genetics and that there's a familial component. And there are many genes that have been identified, including alpha-synuclein, LRKK2, LARC2 or LRK2, BPS35, PARC and PINK, DJ1. And I list some of the other genes that have been identified that are associated with Parkinson's disease. 15% of Parkinson's disease is thought to be familial or genetic, while 85% of it is sporadic without any known familial inheritance. There are a number of risk factors that have been determined by genome-wide association studies. I think at last count, there were over 90, and these can increase one's risk for developing Parkinson's disease, but it's not a, it does not run in families like the synuclein or LARC2 does. And from this, you know, genetics, there's just been an explosion in the understanding of Parkinson's disease. And it's creating new therapeutic opportunities. And um, I've listed again in this slide, the genes that if you have a mutation in one of these genes, there's a high probability that you will develop Parkinson's disease. But these, as I mentioned, are rare. And then there are other genes which um, are less, are very frequent in the population, such as these here. And this list keeps expanding. And then there are a couple of genes in the middle which have a relative degree of risk, glucose-3 recitase and LARC2. And if you notice, um, LARC2 also, if you have mutations in it, can cause um, familial Parkinson's disease. And um, synuclein, there are also um, GWAS have identified very common mutations in synuclein that can increase its relative risk or levels, and hence increasing one's relative risk of developing Parkinson's disease. And so this has led to an explosion of work, you know, in this very complicated slide, you know, working out um, molecular mechanisms of um, how mutations in these genes can cause um, Parkinson's disease. And there are some important, what I would say key nodal points in these pathways that have arisen that um, offer um, potential therapeutic opportunities that could be harnessed to treat and slow the progression of um, Parkinson's disease. One of the genes that is mutated is this gene called alpha-synuclein. It's normally unfolded, but it can aggregate and assemble into what are called fibrils. And it's these fibrils that become part of the Lewy body. And this is the protein that accounts for the majority of um, Parkinson's disease. The majority of patients who um, at the time of their death where they donate their brain for um, examination, the majority of patients uniformly have deposition of alpha-synuclein and a whole host of work has led to the um, understanding that alpha-synuclein 
is the major driver of most forms of Parkinson's disease. Um, and in addition to causing Parkinson's disease, it causes Parkinson's disease with dementia, dementia with Lewy bodies, multi-system atrophy. And from understanding how um, alpha-synuclein can um, cause Parkinson's disease, um, Heiko Brock and colleagues proposed that um, the alpha-synuclein starts to misfold in the GI tract, ascends up a nerve called the vagal nerve and ascends up the brain um, and um, deposits and affects the function of neurons, which lead to the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And, um, and if you look at this, the substantia nigra, which contains the dopamine neurons, it's way up the neural axis. And so it's now appreciated that in the majority of patients, the loss of dopamine neurons is actually occurs mid-stage in the illness, not at the beginning. Whereas some of these other features, these other symptoms are occur much earlier, which provides us an opportunity if we can determine how to diagnose patients early in the course of their illness, where we could potentially prevent the degeneration of dopamine neurons. And as this hypothesis has developed, it's now broken into what's called a body first, where the synuclein starts to accumulate first in the GI tract, the thought is that this is probably about 60% of patients, whereas there's a brain first, where the alpha-synuclein actually starts to accumulate in the brain first, and then descends down perhaps the same pathways, ultimately leading into the same clinical manifestations. This spread of alpha-synuclein has created um, new models of um, Parkinson's disease. And in some of my slides, I'll show one of these animals models that allows us to really dig into and dissect the molecular underpinnings of what causes the neuronal dysfunction in Parkinson's disease. So that's kind of the background information that I wanted to share. And now I'm gonna jump into um, exercise. And I know this is a um, series on the benefits of exercise. And so you'll be hearing from other experts who can expound on some of the things that I'm gonna be talking about. But in this slide, we know that there are benefits of physical activity. And I've, and in this slide, it lists them here. Reduces dementia, the risk of dementia by about 30%. Reduces his, hip fractures by about 68%. Reduces depression by 30% reduces mortality by 30%, cardiovascular disease by 30%, type 2 diabetes by 40%, colon cancer and breast cancer 20 to 30%, just from the benefits of physical activity. Well, there are, so, so we all know that there are benefits of physical activity. Um, but what accounts for that benefit? It's, 
got to be something more than just exercise. So um, this is work of um, Bruce Spiegelman, who's at the Dana-Farber um, Institute at Harvard Medical School. And um, he's interested in metabolism and in particular, um, skeletal muscle and fat cell biology. And several years ago, he discovered this molecule called PGC1 alpha, which is a master regulator of um, mitochondria. And mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. And he found, so if you exercise a mouse, their uh, muscles will enlarge and they'll become this dark red color. And he found that this molecule, PGC1-alpha, if you overexpress it in muscle, it will mimic the effects of exercise. This was a really striking finding. It was published in a prestigious journal in Nature of 2002. So then Bruce Spiegelman's lab used this. Um, well, they knew that PGC1-alpha increased the expression of other molecules. And so he wondered whether PGC1-alpha was causing the expression of some other mo molecule that might account for the benefits of exercise. And to make a long story short, um, 10 years later, he identified this PGC1-alpha dependent myokine. And in this paper, it um, converted, it drove um, white fat to become brown fat, which are more energy producing fat molecules. And they identified the myokine as um, irisin. And so this set up a whole set of investigations as to whether irisin could be accounting for the beneficial effects of exercise. And it's, I should mention that irisin is the first and maybe the only novel protein that is made by muscle that accounts for the beneficial effects of exercise. And so they named it after Iris, the messenger goddess. And so one of the first things that Bruce's lab did, we know that um, exercise may help, may help keep our memories sharp. And so one of the first things they did was they showed that the exercise hormone irisin in mice enhances cognitive function. And what they did was they made a virus that overexpresses irisin. They injected it in the tail vein of a mouse. The um, virus goes to the liver. 
and the liver then makes irisin. The irisin then gets in the bloodstream, cross, crosses the blood-brain barrier, and um, had beneficial effects in the mice. It um, enhanced the ability of um, neurogenesis. So it, it increased new neurons in the hippocampus, the part of the brain that's involved in memory and learning. And it also reduced inflammation in the brain. They found that this peripheral delivered irisin crossed the blood-brain barrier, as shown here. And when they gave irisin to two different animal models of Alzheimer's disease, and here is APP, PS1, and 5XFAD in a Morris water maze. And what a Morris water maze is, it's um, a mouse is put in a large um, tank where the water's white. And in the middle of the tank is a platform. And the mouse is taught where the platform is. Um, and then a mouse that has good memory will swim quickly to the platform to get out of the water. Whereas a mouse that has poor memory will forget where the platform is and will just swim around the tank randomly. And what Irison did, it improved the memory of these mice. So in summary about this part of the talk, Irison is a small polypeptide myokine. And what do I mean by myokine? It's a muscle-derived um, hormone that is released from muscle after certain types of exercise. And Dr. Spiegelman's lab went on to show that the receptor for this hormone is alpha-5, beta-5 integrant. Um, it increases with many forms of exercise, physical activity, and prevent the symptoms of multiple forms of neurodegeneration, including Alzheimer's disease. And I'll show you in some of the other talks, Parkinson's disease. And that a virus overexpressing irisin is able to provide these beneficial effects. So I was at a meeting where Dr. Spiegelman presented this data on irisin and Alzheimer's disease. And um, I asked him this question, could irisin have a beneficial effect on pathologic alpha-synuclein? And Bruce said, let's find out. So Bruce, sent us all his um, reagents for irisin, and we proceeded to test it. And I'll, I'm, I'm gonna show you some of the data for that. But prior to doing that, I just wanted to let you know that there are studies that have shown that there is benefit of exercising in Parkinson's disease. There's the thought that it reduces the risk of PD. It can improve medication efficacy. It can reduce medication side effects. It can improve motor symptoms. It can improve non-motor symptoms. It can improve quality of life. And I think patients with Parkinson's disease know this. You know, that's why there's things like rock steady, boxing, and there are now <clears throat> actually a phase three 
multi-site randomized trial looking at the effects of endurance treadmill exercise on Parkinson's disease. That's, um, I still think they may be enrolling patients. This is the clinical trial um, identifier of those of you that want to find out more information on it. So with that as a backdrop and with um, the data that irisin is beneficial in Alzheimer's disease, exercise beneficial in Parkinson's disease, we undertook a number of studies to try to establish whether irisin may have beneficial effects in one of the major animal models of Parkinson's disease. The first experiment we did was we took mouse neuronal cultures and um, the neurons here are sta stained blue and we applied pathologic alpha-synuclein in the form of what's called alpha-synuclein preformed fibrils. And when alpha-synuclein becomes pathologic, when it's causing disease, it becomes phosphorylated on serine 129. And shown here, um, the phosphor alpha-syn is stained green. And so after applying the alpha syn PFF, you can see the pathologic alpha synuclein, and you can see increasing concentrations of irisin dramatically reduce the amount of phosphorylated alpha synuclein. Here's a quantification of that. This is what's called a Western blot where you can again see the pathologic alpha-synuclein and it sees different bands. And with the increasing concentrations of iris, and you can see that we markedly reduce it. This is quantification of the data. And when you apply the alpha-synuclein PFFs, you can cause death of neurons and the um, iris and dramatically reduces the death of neurons in um, culture. Um, the effects, um, you can add the um, iris in as late as two days and still get um, protection in the neuronal cultures. So having this result in hand, Bruce's lab went on and wanted to make sure that they could replicate it. And so um, we exchanged reagents with Dr. Spiegelman's lab and sure enough, they were able to replicate it. And so then we proceeded to animal studies. And here, we took the alpha-synuclein PFF, injected it into the brain of a mouse at two months of age, gave the mouse that AAV injection of irisin in the tail. This is at two and a half months. It takes about two to four weeks for the virus to start expressing. And then we then took the mice, mice out an additional six months, performed behavioral tests, um, took the brain out and looked for loss and protection of dopamine neurons. And with the um, alpha syn PFF, the pathologic synuclein, we see loss of dopamine neurons. This is here, it's quantified. 
and um, the irisin protects. Now this is admitted, the, the irisin is administered after the pathology is established. It, it's not full-blown pathology, it's probably more um, pre-symptomatic pathology but at least it raises the idea that irisin could be beneficial in patients after they've been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. We then performed a couple of behavioral tests. One is called the pole test. And this is where you place a mouse up on a three meter high pole facing up, you need to train it. Mice don't like being up at um, three meters. It, it would be like putting us on a, um, you know, maybe a hundred foot pole and, um, and um, mice um, after they're trained quickly run down. But a Parkinsonian mouse takes much longer to run down. As you can see here, it takes a longer amount of time. The irisin rescues this Parkinsonian phenotype. The other thing is you can look at strength and um, the um, Parkinsonian mouse has um, less grip strength, whereas the irisin rescues the mouse's grip. So how might um, irisin be protecting? So um, we collaborated with, um, again, with um, Bruce's lab on this as well. We did what's called mass spec, which is a sensitive way to look at changes in proteins. And we found that irisin lowered the levels of pathologic alpha-synuclein and also another protein called APOE. And so we um, looked in vivo in our animal model and much like we found in cultures, the irisin lowered the pathologic alpha-synuclein levels. Again, here is the Western blot. These bands are the pathologic alpha-synuclein. Irisin almost completely eliminates. Um, pathologic alpha-synuclein is degraded by a couple of mechanisms. One is through a mechanism called the um, ubiquitin proteasome system and others through the lysosomal system. And what we found was that um, irisin enhances the degradation of alpha-synuclein through the endolysosomal system. And so it somehow revs up the degradation of pathologic alpha-synuclein. And that's what um, these slides show here. So I've um, shown that um, irisin can prevent the degeneration of dopamine neuron and motor deficits induced by pathologic alpha -sin. Um, It does this by reducing the level of pathologic alpha -sin. And it seems that this is mediated in part through enhancing lysosomal degradation of the pathologic alpha -sin. Um, so in the context of um, Parkinson's disease, as one of my introductory slides, I'd mentioned 
that there are, there's been a lot of work on identifying key nodal points in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And this has led to exciting um, therapeutic opportunities for um, Parkinson's disease. I um, unfortunately haven't updated this slide to include irisin, but irisin's up here where it's actually interfering with um, alpha-synuclein biology. But this um, alpha-synuclein can set in motion a variety of cell death pathways. It can activate microglia. We know that um, GLP receptor agonists like exenatide, NOIO1, can attenuate microglial activation, um, reduce the death of dopamine neurons. We know that there are LARC2 kinase inhibitors that are in clinical trial. We know that there are Parkin and PINK1 activators that inhibit the Parkin PINK1 dependent death pathways. And um, briefly, there are um, C able may um, contribute to the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, and there are C able trials ongoing as well. Um, in addition to irisin, there are chemical chaperones. There are compounds which in, interfere with glucose cerebrosidase function. There's alpha-synuclein aggregation inhibitors, as well as alpha-synuclein monoclonal antibody. I'll um, end it there, acknowledge the folks that did the work. This was done in my lab collaboratively with my wife, Alina. Um, the majority of the work on irisin was done by Tay and Cam. And this was a collaboration with Bruce Spiegelman's lab at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Harvard. And the work was supported by the JPP Foundation. And I'll end it there and um, open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Dawson. I, I just want to say, so you can type your question in the chat box, or you can also use the raise hand function, which is an, a hand icon at the bottom. If you click on that, you can verbally ask your question as well. I'm going to stop sharing so I can. Sure. I don't see any questions yet. Oh, here's one. The first question is as follows. Is it possible that irisin helps maintain the normalcy of the cell, nor normalcy of the cell, and that the processing uh, or removal of alpha-synuclein is enhancing normalcy? I, that, that's a possibility, but but um we 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 think it may be more than that because um, um, irisin is only really made um, during exercise and 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 so it's probably a response to the beneficial effects of of um, irisin. The next question is, um, is production of irisin greater with intensity or duration of exercise? Great question. It seems that um, irisin is primarily formed with what's called endurance exercise. So it'd really be the, um, 
the duration of exercise, not the intensity. Um, last week, Dr. Jankowak gave a really compelling talk on how specific exercises that also involve linking or thinking like rock steady boxing are particularly effective in slowing cognitive decline. What are, what are my thoughts? Well, it's, um, you know, there's this old adage, um, use it or lose it. So if you're exercising and thinking at the same time, I, I, I think it would go hand in hand that it's going to be much more beneficial. When do you expect human trials and commercialization of viruses? Great question. So um, we, we've had um, discussions with among Dr. Spiegelman's group about this. And the general thought is that um, the viral approach to it may not be the best approach in that um, um, there are some toxicities with using um, these adeno-associated viruses in the liver. And so the, the plan is to make recombinant irisin, where we, in essence, grow it up in a test tube, optimize the condition so it'd be grown up in big vats. And then you would then, um, it would be administered like, um, other biologics where you get an infusion once every three to six months. And that that's gonna take probably three to five years before it's ready to go into human trials is probably a, um, the best estimate. We, we, we hope things go faster, but to be conservative, we think about three to five years. Some folks with PD, seem to use extreme exercise to control their symptoms. Would this increase the expression of irises? Would this effect also reduce AD symptoms? Extreme exercise. I think it's, again, I, I, I think it's more endurance exercise. It's more the length of exercise than the intensity of the exercise. You know, you do need to, um, you know, reach, I think about 60 to 80% of your maximal heart rate for your age group for about, at a minimum of about 30 minutes, four times a week to get the benefits of exercise. I don't think you need, you know, to be, um, you know, um, doing Ironman competitions or things like that. Would increased levels of virus and be expected to have the same effect with all people with PD or they, might have different effects in people with decreased lysosomal function. Great question. We don't know. One of the things, if, if you remember, I mentioned one of the proteins that's lowered was APOE. And um, for those of you who know, um, there are different APOE subtypes in humans. There's APOE 2, APOE 3, APOE 4. APOE 4 is associated with a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Also, people who are APOE 4 
tend to do worse with alpha-synuclein than ApoE2. So one of the possibilities which we're looking at, we don't have any data yet, there's a possibility that ApoE or um, irisin could lower ApoE4 levels, and we're, we're looking at that. Are marathons better than sprints? Yeah, because that, that's sort of a form of endurance exercise. But I, I don't think you need to do an all-day marathon. You know, it's a 30-minute, you know, uh, I, I, I think to see the benefits of exercise. Any other questions? I um, can't see hands being raised. So if if you um, do have your hand raised, you can just speak up. Um, there aren't any raised hands, Dr. Dawson. So I think that would be the end of the questions. Some really good questions there. Um, I would like to thank you again, Dr. Dawson. That was such an interesting uh, presentation on new research. And again, really appreciate all of you for attending and for asking some really good questions. And we will see you at our next or our final talk in the Global Symposium series on March 29th with Dr. Daniel Korkos, speaking on impact of exercise on PD progression. So if I was going to say if there aren't any more questions, but I think I do see one raised hand. Are you okay with answering that question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Um, we've got two raised hands now. So, oh, one of them is me. I think I raised my hand. <laughs> one second here. Okay, go ahead, Paul. Thanks for your talk, doctor. Is um, so based on what you're saying about um, duration, um, is cardiovascular centered exercise superior to resistance exercise for production or expression of virus? Oh, I, you know, that I don't know. You know, one of the things I was looking over um, notes that um, Dr. Spiegelman provided me and and in his notes he says all forms of exercise increase it but the the the, the one that increases it the most is endurance so it's 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 possible um or or likely that other forms of exercise also increase it but i think to get the full benefits of iris and it needs to be this more sustained form of exercise which would happy be how I answer it but 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 you know it it, it it would be really be a question to ask Dr. Spiegelman thank you okay I, I think that was our last question and and there are some comments for you as well in the chat box Dr. Dawson uh once again thank you so much for taking the time to put on such an interesting uh, talk for us. Thank you everyone for attending and we'll see you on the 29th with our last talk um, with Dr. Daniel Korkos. See you then and have a good afternoon. Bye now. Bye now, thank you. Thanks.